Okay, folks, welcome to another session of PHI 215. Uh, today we are uh, looking at our last little bit of our unit on free will. Uh, so we're going to be looking at two writers today, uh, Ted Chang and uh, Dirk Paraboom. Uh, so the question today uh, is right here in the title. Uh, it's about uh, the relationship between uh, having free will and having a meaningful life. Uh, so some philosophers have claimed, uh, and you might have also had this intuition, uh, that our lives would somehow be uh, robbed of meaning or a point uh, if we didn't have free will. Uh, so we're going to think about a couple of ways of thinking about that issue today. So this will connect to some of the things that we thought about earlier in the semester. Uh, John Hick, for instance, claimed that uh, a loving God gives us free will. Uh, and that's part of uh, his soul-making defense against the problem of evil. Uh, Alvin Plantinga also uh, made this sort of free will defense uh, against the problem of evil, again suggesting that the reason why evil exists in the universe is because uh, certain choices are genuinely open to us, and when certain choices are genuinely open to us, uh, people will make the wrong choice sometimes. Uh, and then furthermore, uh, a world with free will in it is a better one than one without it, and that's why God made a world with free will in it. Uh, and even if uh, you're not concerned about the problem of evil, uh, you might also just be persuaded by the thought that uh, morality and human relationships would be pointless or empty if nobody had any free will. So we're going to be thinking through that issue today. So we're going to start uh, with a piece of uh, fiction. Uh, by the writer Ted Chang. Uh, now this story I sent around uh, the original version of it that was printed in the journal Nature, but it's now published uh, in this book right here, Exhalation Stories. Let's blow that up a tad. Uh, so this is a book uh, that I read over Christmas break. It's a deeply philosophical book, and there's lots of super interesting stuff in here. Um, you might have also heard of Ted Chang because he was, he wrote another book of stories, uh, one of which, uh, was the basis for the movie Arrival, uh, which is a wonderful movie, and it's also a deeply philosophical movie. Uh, so if you haven't seen that yet, uh, I heartily recommend it. Um. In any case, uh, we're looking at an extremely short story. Uh, it only takes up one page in the journal Nature and about four pages uh, in his book. Uh, but here's, here's the big premise uh, in Chang's story. He says, uh, eventually one day somebody invents a predictor. Uh, it basically looks like this. It's like a little remote with a light bulb so this green button can light up right? Uh, and what it does is that it has a time delay on it. Uh, so it looks ahead into the future, and then uh, it is operated uh, with a delay such that the future events are then uh, indicated by the button. So here's what happens. Uh, the light under the button lights up one second before anyone ever pushes it. So you can imagine like the button lights up and then exactly one second later, uh, someone pushes it and anytime you ever try to push the button, uh, it's going to light up uh, exactly one second uh, before you push it. So if you see it light up, you can't not push it. And uh, if you try to push it without it, uh, or if you, uh, you know, try to wait it out, uh, the button will never light up. And 
yeah, so it's it's basically a perfect predictor of when the button will be pushed, right? Now, the narrator in this story says that this basically proves that there's no free will. He said, uh, you know, there's lots of arguments out there. So we could look at arguments like the whole box argument from hard determinism or uh, Galen Strassen's argument that uh, random events can't be free events. So those arguments were out there, but nobody was ever really convinced by them. Uh, now that we see that the future is perfectly determined and that there's no way of getting away from it, uh, the narrator says that that proves uh, that there's no such thing as free will. And what happens here is people respond to this in a certain way. So he says that some people, realizing that their choices don't matter, refuse to make any choices at all. Like a legion of Bartleby the Scriveners, they no longer engage in spontaneous action. Eventually, a third of those who play with the predictor must be hospitalized because they won't feed themselves. The end state is akinetic mutism, a kind of waking coma. So they don't get up, they don't say anything, uh, they, they don't do anything, right? The idea is uh, they just stop believing that any of their choices matter because the entire future is predetermined. Uh, so Chang has some fun with this, right? You know, he imagines, uh, you know, doctors saying to these patients in a state of akinetic mutism, uh, well, you used to have fun and you used to have friends and you used to do all these things that were worthwhile. You didn't have free will back then either. So why don't you just keep doing them? Uh, and people respond basically by saying, yeah, but I didn't know back then what I know now. And now that I know that there's no free will, I just can't do anything. And we might wonder, um, you might look at the distinction between fatalism and determinism on page 245. Uh, now, the distinction between fatalism and determinism is that with fatalism, it says that no matter what you try, certain things are going to happen. Uh, whereas determinism says that uh, even though the universe is deterministic, trying and effort and agency, uh, in some sense, are part of the universe. So we might wonder whether this is a story about determinism or fatalism. Uh, and, but we might also wonder about this further question, uh, whether it makes sense for these people in the one third uh, of people who play with predictors uh, to think that their choices don't matter at all uh, once they realize that the future is deterministic. So now we'll shift gears to our other reading. Uh, now we're just looking at standard uh, philosophy rather than a piece of literature. Uh, and Dirk Paraboom's essay, uh, Meaning in Life Without Free Will. Uh, so Paraboom is a free will skeptic. And it's more than hard determinism, right? Paraboom isn't just saying that the universe is deterministic and therefore, uh, because compatibilism is also true, there's no such thing as free will. Um, I've brought this point up a couple of times in the lectures now. He agrees with Galen Strawson's view that in addition to determinism being incompatible with free will, uh, Paraboom also agrees in this paper that if the universe were indeterministic, then that wouldn't show we have free will either. And he suggests that agent causation, like the kind of causation that we saw defended by Richard Taylor and Timothy O'Connor last time. He thinks that it's a coherent theory, uh, but he goes on to say that given evidence from our best scientific theories, it's not credible that we are in fact agent causes. So there's a better way to explain human behavior uh, than in this idea that uh, we are substances 
that initiate events, but which are not events ourselves. So again, we don't want to think about whether or not we have free will. Uh, we've already sort of worked through our menu of options that we might take on that question. Uh, we just want to look today um, at the question of whether life would be meaningless if we didn't have free will. And here are some of the thoughts that you might be thinking yourself uh, and that Paraboom tries to address in this paper. So you might think that there's no such thing as responsibility if people don't have free will. Uh, that nothing is anybody's fault. You know, we, you just blame the universe. Uh, I showed you that comic. I can actually get it on screen again. Uh, by Will McPhail. Uh, you know, where when you stop believing in free will, you basically say, like, free will is an illusion. I can't control my actions. Blame the universe, baby. So the idea here is that there's a serious lack of responsibility associated uh, with uh, denying that there's free will. Uh, a second problem is that there would be no justification for punishing wrongdoers uh, if there was no such thing as free will. Third, human relationships would have less value. Uh, so we might think that uh, we respect and love people not just because of what they're like, but because of the free choices that they make. Um, so we might think that it might lessen our ability to feel gratitude towards others or to love others uh, in the same way that we do, uh, assuming that we do currently believe uh, that people act with free will. Um, and then a third thought would be that maybe human achievements would have less value because again, uh, your actions are no longer something that you could have done otherwise with in the genuine incompatibilist sense. Uh, what you do is basically an effect of uh, your genes and your upbringing and the laws of nature, which aren't really in your ultimate control. Uh, so what we're gonna do is just quickly run through uh, some of the big points in how Paraboom wants to respond to these questions. So first, the thought that there is no such thing as moral responsibility if there's no free will. Here's how Paraboom replies. He says, we can still distinguish between responsibility as self-disclosing and responsibility as accountability or control. So he says, when he denies that we have the kind of free will that incompatibilists think we have, he is denying that we have responsibility as accountability or control. Uh, because of your nature, which is not up to you, uh, it's not really in your control uh, whether you do what you do. But you can still be uh, responsible for certain things and the fact that you can be the cause of certain things, um, and that the actions that you do uh, still disclose the kind of self or character uh, that you have. Uh, so the thought here is that there are certain senses of responsibility uh, which still remain, even if uh, we don't have free will in the incompatibilist sense. So yeah, we can still have excellences of character, and he uses the word eretaic in the essay a couple of times. Uh, what he means by that is we can still have excellences of character, right? Uh, but free will skepticism is just a denial of uh, that it's in our control what kind of character that we can ultimately have. Uh, and further the thought that nobody deserves praise or blame or punishments or rewards. You don't ultimately deserve uh, to be the kind of person that you are, so you don't deserve punishment or rewards uh, for the actions that flow from that kind of person, right? So 
we can say that people are good people. We just can't say that uh, they deserve or don't deserve anything in particular. So here's a further thought. Uh, if we get rid of the idea of what people deserve, and that's what Paraboom means when he says that free will says that, the, or that free will skepticism shows that there's no such thing as moral responsibility, you might be thinking in retributivist terms, right? That uh, punishments should fit the crime because when you do a bad thing, you deserve a punishment. Here's how Paraboom replies. He says, even though retributivist theories of punishment have to be thrown out if you're a free will skeptic, uh, because free will skeptics say that people don't deserve uh, any good thing or bad thing, uh, he says that there might be non-retributivist theories about how to deal with wrongdoers. So we might start thinking about how policies of punishment might encourage certain kinds of good behavior and deter or discourage certain kinds of bad behavior. Uh, and he points out, you know, we might think about how uh, individuals have a right to defend themselves in a case of self-defense, as long as it's with the least harmful method uh, possible in order to save yourself. So we might say the least harmful method necessary uh, for self-protection. So the thought would be is uh, if you can stop a robber simply by locking your door, uh, in that case, you don't get to shoot the robber, right? Uh, so the thought here is we might have a right to defend ourselves in the case of criminal justice as well. So it might be that isolating uh, violent criminals from the population at large uh, might still be a justifiable way of responding uh, to their violence. Uh, and we might think, and this is sort of uh, prescient for these uh, present times, maybe keeping violent criminals away from the general public is kind of like placing people under quarantine. So, uh, you know, the rest of the population doesn't end up getting COVID-19 or Ebola or what have you. So let's move on to the next one. Uh, there's the thought that human relationships would have less value if nobody had free will. So here's something that the philosopher P.F. Strassen said. Uh, now just keep in mind, I've been telling you guys about the philosopher Galen Strassen. P.F. Strassen is a different philosopher. In fact, he's Galen Strassen's dad. Uh, but Peter Strassen said, uh, we can't take the objective attitude when we have reactive attitudes towards other people. Uh, so when he's talking about reactive attitudes towards other people, he's talking about the sorts of emotional responses towards people that we make to them for uh, the choices that they make. Uh, so some common examples are things like resentment, love, and gratitude. Uh, so what Strassen is saying is like we can't look at uh, a person as just like a cause or an effect of the entire universe and some matter in motion uh, that's just part of the deterministic universe. Uh, in order to resent the things that they've done or to love them for their actions and choices or to feel gratitude. Uh, so P.F. Strassen's basic idea is that that's an attitude that's worth taking. And he also points out it's these are attitudes that we can't give up. Uh, and so we shouldn't... Uh, we shouldn't deny that people have free will, is basically Strassen's idea. And we can't expect people to deny that we have free will. Here's how Paraboom replies. He says, actually, it is possible to love someone and value being loved by them, even if you deny that they're capable of agent causation. Uh, so even if you deny that people could have been any other way than they have been, 
you, know, you might still love them. And you might think about the fact that, like, I love my dog, right? But the fact that my dog is the way that he is is because of generations upon generations of selective breeding. Uh, moreover, experiences of, you know, me feeding it and playing with him. Uh, that he has the kind of character that he's like. Uh, but uh, you might love your children, even if you don't really believe that they could have been any other way than they are. Um, and you might also uh, love your romantic partner, even though you might think that the way that they are is something that comes to them naturally. And you might even uh, value being loved by your children or by your romantic partners, um, even if you believe that uh, loving you is something that they couldn't have done otherwise with. So here's the last thought. We might think that somebody might say, well, like, look, part of why I care about having free will is because it makes me feel like I am responsible for the way that I am and that I deserve credit uh, for the excellences of character that I've developed. Here's how Paraboom replies here. He says, you can still strive to achieve your aims, even if you don't have free will. He just says that you can't coherently uh, believe you don't have free will and pursue praiseworthiness. But, you know, you can still like try to help people in need and succeed in those aims, and that's completely compatible uh, with you lacking free will. Uh, so he points out that a big part of seeing self-worth in yourself doesn't depend on indeterminism or free will. And to further back up this point, he points out how uh, when we think about how many of our achievements, so you might think about uh, which college you go to or um, you know, the kind of work that you do or your character traits, you might realize that a lot of the reasons why you have achieved these things or why you have certain character traits is a matter of upbringing, the kindness of others, luck. And when we think about all these things that made us the way we are and made us achieve the things we've achieved, uh, Paraboom suggests we often feel thankful instead of feeling uh, dismay these realizations. So again, you know, it was further pointed out that uh, it's harder to have gratitude uh, when you start to think about uh, the universe is deterministic, but uh, lacking control uh, might actually increase the amount of gratitude uh, that you might feel. So that's going to wrap it up. Uh, so we've at least seen a couple of ways to think about this question, about how uh, freedom of the will might relate to having a meaningful life. So, as we've seen, Paraboom thinks the fact that we have no free will, he thinks it's a fact that we have no free will. I'm not saying it's a fact that we have no free will. Uh, that's for each of us to figure out for ourselves. But if it were the case that we had no free will, Paraboom thinks that would be something that we can deal with and which is still compatible with living a meaningful life. Uh, so it'll be up to you to figure out uh, whether you think people lack free will. Do you agree with Paraboom? Or do you agree with one of the incompatibilists or perhaps compatibilists about free will? Um, and you might also think about this question about whether agent causation or maybe simply compatibilist uh, freedom, uh, and how these things uh, relate uh, to, to our concept of a life well lived. Uh, so uh, that's going to do it for today. Uh, thanks for listening in. Uh, be well, and don't hesitate to get in touch if you need to. All right, bye.